guys and welcome to a new video on Sonal's Life. Now, if you're a New Japan fan like me, and I guess you are if you're clicking on this video, you all know that we are basically halfway through this year's G1 Climax. And as always, and as I always do, we are here for a mid-tournament review. There have been so many matches, so many shows. I mean, literally like two days ago, there was three in a row. Now, by the time this video gets posted, there will have been another show. That is not included. The Sunday, the Sunday, the 30th of July will not be involved. But I'm going to talk about all the best matches. The matches that maybe weren't so great. And also what I'm thinking of the <clears throat> progress of everything going on and the state of each block. Now, there are some people who have not been a fan of this year's G1. I guess it all stems from the fact there are 32 competitors in four different blocks of eight. At the helm of it, that's a lot of competitors. We had it similar last year, but a lot of people prefer the 10-man, 10-man. I personally think that's not been an issue. Whereas last year, the four-block format was something I didn't enjoy. This year, it's actually not been too bad. There's been a nice spread of wrestlers amongst each of the blocks. There is none that stand out more in terms of who you think is going to be a winner. There are strong wrestlers and weaker wrestlers in each. And there have been some amazing like shockers it's not been predictable there have been blocks and still now there is most people thinking i don't know how this is gonna go albeit everyone pretty much that i know wants naito to win and thinks he's gonna win but at this point in time that seems all up in the air so i'm gonna quickly look over the top matches because i normally do this when we do the whole full review but considering how many matches i've already put on the list now I feel like if we wait until the end, we're just going to be listing matches for the entire duration of the video. So yeah, let's get going on that. One of the big narratives going into these shows are the three Reiwa Musketeers. And it was announced, and I've probably mentioned this before, I might not have, that Yotosuji, Shoto Umino and Ren Narita are the new three Musketeers. Following on from some of the biggest wrestlers in New Japan, they are taking over that legacy. So one of the first matches that I was obsessed with, I think it was within the first few days, was Shota Umino versus Ren Narita. Now, although the three Reiwa Musketeers and Uemura, who, Uemura, where are you? Were all in the same dojo class, there is something special about Shota and Narita because we know that within each dojo class, you have two wrestlers who normally have a feud with each other. So let's say um, we've had... I guess it was like Shabbat and Tanahashi, maybe, don't hold me to it. More recently, I guess you could say, we've had Jay and David Finlay. Sho and Yo. I guess even to an extent, there was like Okan and Hikaleo. Like, they were put together in these matches. They were in this, they started around the same time. This match was perfect. Now, for me going into this, we all know that Shota had a slightly better return to New Japan. He had some big matches, even globally he's done great stuff, compared to Narita. However, this match put everything else aside and showcased two people who are the future of New Japan. Their styles are different, so Shota embodies more Tanahashi showmanship in his ring work. Narita is more, I guess like he says, Shibata, uh, Monoru Suzuki, the more mat-based style. I kind of think it's funny that you've got as Gabriel Kidd quoted, the Tanahashi Naito wannabe versus the Shibata wannabe. However, in this match, it didn't feel like that. It felt like they were trying to be themselves and beat their rival. And it worked really well. Again, the result was perfect. It was, on the first day, a time limit draw. But I think it worked perfectly. If you watch the tournament so far, you'll know that the time limit draws have been between these three musketeers. Because it shows that neither of them are better than each other. They are all on the same level, it's just how they're going to use it. The next match was also in the first two days, I think it was the second day. It was a C block, C, B block, B block, not C block. And it was My Holy Emperor Tai Chi versus the Aerial Assassin and the United States Champion Will Ospreay. Now, going into this, I did some predictions on True Here Heat and also on Dangerous, I mean, on Ace Techers. So you should go and watch those and listen to those. And we were like, what's, who's going to win this? And I said, my heart goes with Tai Chi, but it's not going to happen. Well, it did. Tai Chi and Osprey had a phenomenal match back in the New Beginnings tour. And I think it was massively underrated. Not overrated, it was underrated. And once again, they've put on probably one of my favourite matches of the tournament. 
it was hard hitting, fast, athletic. There weren't as many karate kicks as I expected, but you could see the difference between Tai Chi over the years. He is now not cheating at all. He's putting his heart into every match, not just the odd few like Shingo and Ishii and Okada, the ones that bring something out of him. And the fact that he has this KOPW title, yes, Osprey had the US title, but for him, he wanted to show the prestige of his title. And the two couldn't be more different. I mean, Tai Chi and Osprey are on different ends of the spectrum when it comes to style and personality, but it blends so well together. Osprey didn't take Tai Chi lightly because some people tend to do that. And in that, they put on an amazing match, which Tai Chi won. And oh my God. Um, I was quite sad at the start because he was in the semi-main event. But in the main event, Sonata won, so he brought Tai Chi out into his hometown of Hokkaido, I believe it was. And I just feel like, again, while it was one of the big spoilers and one of the big surprises, it was a really nice precedent for the first few days. And yeah, Holy Emperor Tai Chi, he has a title shot ahead of him. Rather than go by day, I'm going to go by like grouping the matches together, mainly because I wrote these matches down and I don't actually know what day they are. So then we have some hard hitting matches. I feel like the first two I just wanted to bring out because they were in the first few days. We had Eddie Kingston versus Ishii. Now I know a lot of people would goddamn say this is one of the best of the tournament. And while I am not normally a fan of big, fat, big beefy men slapping the shit out of each other, I mean, I am, I'm a wrestling fan. But, like, I quite like diversity in the match. This was phenomenal. Ishii and Eddie Kingston are two men who, I guess, are very similar in their approach to wrestling. They like the strong style. In the post-match comments, Ishii even said, like, Eddie Kingston has always said he has loved this kind of pro wrestling. And he pulled it off perfectly. They are two very big men, but also two very fast and athletic especially with Ishii, we know that he can go with the fastest of the New Japan wrestlers, but also the biggest. And what I loved is that there was so much content in this match, I guess you could say. From the very beginning, neither man let up even an inch. Now, bear in mind, remember, Eddie Kingston has this never open weight title. So for Ishii, this is a shot at a title that I guess, while maybe wouldn't have been on his radar, is something similar to the never open weight title that he has had so many times in his career and raised the prestige. Now, I might favor a bit in this and you're gonna say is when they were exchanging chops and stuff in the middle of the ring. Cause God, I have never seen Ishii's chest get that red. They were just stood there, two men just slapping each other. And bear in mind, this was at Korokum, which is not a very big venue, albeit it was jam packed because can I say, Korokum crowds are, superior honestly make every show amazing so these crowds were literally like in shock as these vibrations happen and it was just pure beauty and i guess like it was even bigger because it was ishii's first win of the tournament and what i liked is after the match ishii went don't just love japanese wrestling be in japanese wrestling and i think he even teased teaming with each other so i would happily see an ishii and eddie kingston team albeit i'm not really forgiven Eddie Kingston for chucking JY out on New Japan. And then we also had Hanari versus Shingo. These two have had match after match after match, which are complete bangers. And this was legit no different. Hanari has come out with a completely new, not character, but a new confidence. He has his tattoo to symbolize his ancestors, his heritage. And I think that has just added to this motivation within him. He is no longer that young lion or the one who didn't really have an excursion and was sort of left in the shadows in the undercard. He is the future of New Japan. Whether you want to mention the three Reiwa Musketeers or the LA Dojo guys, you need to have people like Hanare in that mix. And again, Shingo, whenever he has a match with anyone, it is always phenomenal. And I feel like amongst all the amazing matches, this one was probably going to be forgotten about, but it shouldn't because it was amazing. Let's have a break from all that serious stuff. And I just want to give a special shout out to a match that people are going to be like, Sonal, this doesn't deserve to be on your list. Yes, it does. Tetsuya Naito versus Toru Yano for the D-Block. We all know Yano is one of those guys that, while some New Japan people might be like, he doesn't belong in the tournament. New Japan veterans, New Japan fans who really love the product knows that Yano deserves to be in this match, in this tournament. And this match proved it. We all know Naito has probably the world's longest entrance. He has to come out. He has to take off his suit. It's longer than Ishii's. 
Oh, Naito was really taking the mick this time. You could see Yano getting riled up in the ring. And so not only did he take so long, but it got to the point where they had to restart his music. And rather than continue coming down the ring, Naito went back up and started his entrance again. Now, Yano, this tournament has continued the use of tape. And what I love so much about this match is, yeah, it wasn't match of the year candidate, but it was a really nice sort of rest between these big intense matches. It didn't last long, but it was funny. It made people laugh. And I think it's sort of similar when you say Taguchi in the best of Super Junior. Maybe not so much because Taguchi puts on big matches, but Yano is that nice bit of relief. And while he cheats, it is not in that like, ew, house of torture way which by the way i'll bring up a match that wasn't great the house of torture i just think it was a nice bit of fresh air and really nicely balanced with these matches i'm going to talk about now and i said i was going to talk about the matches that have stood out later on and i am but the next few matches are all within the a block a block has shine so for anyone who doesn't know we're going to call this the baby block with sonata and chase owens on the extra so we have sonata champion veteran chase and all the babies so hikaleo gabriel kid the three Rariwas, and uh, musketeers so shota narita and suji and also kaito kiyomiya now kaito kiyomiya has put on some great matches with this and why i've brought up the a block is because the next three are going to include them so kiyomiya i knew him before he did the g1 before any of his stuff with new japan i even really watched noah but i knew of kiyomiya and i'd watch some of his stuff he has not done, I guess, as well as many people expected, but has put on some bangers. As expected, as I predicted, his match against Sonado was beautiful. This was the one where there was legit two seconds until the time limit. And I guess on the outside, Sonado and Kiyomiya have a lot more in common than you'd expect. They're both very athletic wrestlers they are not just one thing they can do the submissions they can do the high flying they can do the athleticism but i guess their personalities and their roots in pro wrestling have been different so kiyomiya is young as soon as he went into noah he quickly became their ace and has now slowly been i guess like plateauing whereas sonada has always been the work working man he has worked his hardest and has built it up to finally get to the top of new japan and what I loved is that Sonata, as expected, he has not been underestimating any of this young talent. Even in the post-match comments, he was praising Kiyomiya, saying, it can't be easy to come to a new promotion all by yourself and wrestle against some people who are firm, like who are firmly loved by the New Japan fans. Now, if you really don't have time to watch any matches, this is one of them that you have to. It was great. And again, Kiyomiya has had matches with all of the guys, most of the guys in the block already, and they've been great. His match against Shota Umano was amazing as well. And similarly, I'm going to say Sonada. While he's not that champion in terms of putting on match of the year contenders with these G1s, because you're not going to expect that with the young guys, he is doing his job perfectly as the champion, but as a different champion. He is not being that in-your-face guy who's like, I want to put on amazing matches and win and do this. Because, I mean, at the moment, he actually has won every match but his main goal I guess and the challenge he was probably set by New Japan is to make these young guys look good and he has done that in every match while he has always come out with the win he has not made any of them look weak whether it was Hikaleo and um, Shoto Mino, Kaito Kiyomiya in particular the one that I've put down is his rematch against Yota Suji now obviously Sonata was Suji's comeback match they had a great bout here they had the same amazing match at the G1. They knew each other a bit better so they could counter each other. And what I feel is that while Suji has grown in confidence, obviously he's more matches and stuff, Sonada has grown in confidence as a champion. He's no longer afraid to be like, yeah, I am good, but also perfectly balances it with the fact that he knows that he is helping to build the foundations for New Japan. Because while he is, I guess he quoted, he's the veteran, he is still far from retirement, far from being one of the dad club. So he still needs to show himself and that's what he has done. Now the last match has just happened. It was literally a few days ago. And as expected, it was a banger. Will Ospreay versus Kazuchika Okada. They have a very long history. 
Okada brought Osprey into the company all those years ago after facing him in Rev Pro. They were very close as Chaos stablemates. And then Osprey turned his back, like most people do, to create the United Empire. This match from the very beginning had the crowds on the edge of their seats. And oddly enough, and I think it's been a narrative for Okada, who's been a bit of a dick this series, Osprey was the firm fan favourite. They gave everything that fans wanted within the 20 minute limit. I keep referring to these post-match comments, but they really link into what happened in the match. Osprey was saying that he'd asked Jeff Cobb for advice, and Jeff Cobb was honest and saying, it's probably going to go the full length because, and Osprey cemented it. It is very hard to beat Okada in anything less than 20 minutes because he is one of the best wrestlers in the world. But what I loved is that Osprey, I had the gripes with Osprey at the um, All Elite show with the cheating and stuff. When Osprey is in New Japan, that is when he is the best. He was showcasing his aerial assassin. So he was doing the high flying, but also the very intense stuff he can do now he has more weight. And Okada was relishing in it. I think Okada, for all of his amazingness, still sees Osprey as that young kid he brought into chaos. But Osprey proved that, and in around 17 minutes, hit the Stormbreaker, so he had to bring out the big guns to get the win. And the crowd was so excited. Osprey, honestly, is one of the most loved guys, I think, in New Japan. He said, you know what, normally I have Okan, I have um, the other members of the United Empire seconding me, but it was, I think it was Ota? Oh, to you are seconding me and like they loved it and I think while people have grievances of the G1 so far it has been for me personally much better than last year and I'm saying something because Jay's not even in it this year the quality amongst the blocks have all been pretty decent yes we've had some few issues so some wrestlers haven't lived up to their potential um we had so much potential for the David Finley versus Evil match there's been issues with the Bullet Club, but it just seemingly just finished. Evil in himself should not be in this tournament. But overall, the blocks have been great. The stars stand out for me, A and B. Block A and B are phenomenal. All of the young stars in Block A have done amazing. I've not had a bad match there. Even Gabriel Kidd, who I've not mentioned, has put on some amazing storytelling matches. His match against Kaito Kiyomiya, which ended in a count out. So much passion in him. Um, B Block as well, some amazing wrestlers. I want to give that shout out to guys like Yoshihashi, um, Tai Chi, who've been putting on consistently good matches. The C Block, so the Working Man Block, we've had some amazing matches from Ishii, Hanare, Shingo. Even D Block, which I guess some people were disappointed at, I don't know why, still think it's phenomenal. Um, Zack Sabre Jr., Je Jeff Cobb is on a roll at the moment. Even Tanahashi, for all of his flaws with his health, He's still putting on great matches by adapting his style. Like his match against Zack Sabre Jr., great. And obviously Naito, you can't lose with him. They've all put on great matches. So I hope that it continues. I know that it'll probably not die down, but as the wrestlers get more matches, their bodies are going to suffer. But I'm excited. I still have Naito as my winner, so we'll see how that works. Now, hopefully you enjoyed my little mid-review. I know for a lot of people, I know myself, it's hard to keep up with so many shows, whether you're in the UK, so it's during a working day, or in America, where it's in the middle of the night. It can't be easy to watch so many shows and balance it with your life. So hopefully this gave you a little insight into what happened and the matches you should go and watch. Now it's time for you to talk to me. Let me know on social media, so at wrestling underscore chat and in the comments, what are your thoughts on the tournament so far? Which matches or wrestlers have stood out? And which blocks are you properly feeling like this is what wrestling is? Has any of your predictions changed? Let me know in the comments on social media. Remember, as always, hit like, share with all your friends and make sure to hit subscribe. We have the G1 final coming up in a few weeks. Then I'm going to attend the Rev Pro show, so the anniversary show with a lot of New Japan stars. And then, although I'm not attending it, the All Elite Pro Wrestling All In Show in London. So I'll be back with reviews, vlogs of all of that. So make sure to hit subscribe and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.